me. So my name's Nicole Thomas. And just as a little intro, if um, folks are not familiar with myself or Homebase, I work at Homebase. We're a nonprofit technical assistance provider. So we provide TA to COCs across the nation. And in particular, we work really closely with the Office of Supportive Housing in Santa Clara County. And one of the many things we do is put on trainings on behalf of OSH. And so uh, a part of our suite of trainings is always a Navigating Mainstream Benefits series and CalWORKs is the one we're focusing in on today. So just as an introduction and an icebreaker, so you're all familiarized with the chat function and feature, we're gonna ask that you introduce yourselves in the chat with your name, your organization, and what your favorite dessert is. Um, I, for a month, cut out sugar so that I could celebrate my birthday with dessert. And so I have a cake waiting for me, but I'd love to hear your favorite dessert. And if you don't have a sweet tooth, favorite snack. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over now to um, Lisa and Juliana so they can introduce themselves um, from Bay Area. Hi. Um... I'm Lisa Newstrom. I'm a managing attorney at Bay Area Legal Aid and um, have been practicing in public benefits um, in Santa Clara County as well as in immigration a little bit for um, quite some time. Um, and Juliana and I will be here to present today. I'll let you introduce yourself, Juliana. Hi, I am Juliana Mancini and I am an attorney at Bay Area Legal Aid. I've been practicing public benefits now for, I guess, two and a half years. Um, before that, I was a public defender. Um, and so, yeah, Lisa and I are excited to be here and to give you guys this training. Okay, and with that, I'm just gonna jump in. We have a really generous amount of time today, but we do have a lot to cover. And I, the thing I'm most excited about is this is the first time virtually that we're trying to recreate the experience from our in-person trainings of kind of like um, getting to work on case simulation scenarios. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of polling questions um, and kind of some Q&A as we go along. Please feel free if you have questions as we go along to put them in the chat. Um, and Juliana and I will, whoever is not presenting at the moment, will triage those and either respond in chat um, if possible, um, respond uh, verbally so everyone can hear, or we may say like, we'll get to that or we can stick around at the end and answer that. Um, particularly if it's something more involved or like case specific. Okay. Um, and with that, we'll just jump in. Here we go. So um, we are both with Bay Area Legal Aid. Um, which does free civil legal services for low-income residents in the Bay Area. So we cover seven counties um, and we have a number of practice areas, public benefits, um, but we also do housing, um, domestic violence, uh, consumer rights, youth, healthcare access. Um, and so there's a lot of crossover between all of those and the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, because we understand that you all are working with families who are um, primarily homeless or um, at risk of homelessness, um, we're especially going to try and cover um, issues related to how CalWORKs can help stabilize people's housing and really like um, stabilize their economic situation. Okay. Okay, so uh, what is CalWORKs? Uh, CalWORKs is federally known as the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, or TANF. Um, previously, it was known as AFDC. So if you ever see that anywhere, you, you'll know that they're talking about the CalWORKs program. And so CalWORKs provides cash aid to needy families who have children under the age of 18 um, in California. The 
TANF program is called CalWORKS, which stands for uh, California Work Opportunity and Responsibility to Kids. And the program is intended to be time limited and help transition and move people into employment. So there are two components to eligibility for CalWORKS um, or to the CalWORKS program. So the first one is eligibility. And when they look at eligibility, they look at your, you know, the eligibility criteria. And there is this idea of how poor do you have to be, which we will discuss in a later slide. And then the second component to the CalWORKS program is welfare to work. And uh, it's what you have to do to keep getting that cash aid, employment, education, or training and training. Okay. So with CalWORKS, um, you have a family. Um, CalWORKS is a program for families with children. So you have to have a caretaker relative um, with at least one minor child in the home. Um, you can also have a pregnant person. Um, and uh, something that gets asked a lot of times, well, what counts as children in the home? If there is split custody, it's whoever has care and control 51% of the time. Um, if it's exactly 50-50, it's whoever applied first. Um, there used to be a requirement that the person who, if it was like just a single individual who is pregnant, they had to be in a certain trimester. It used, first it was third trimester, and then they moved it up to second trimester. And now you are eligible from basically the point of becoming pregnant. Um, so that's a new development this year. Um, the child must also be deprived of parental support or care. Um, so that means that one parent at least is absent, deceased, incapacitated, which is um, like being disabled, um, but it can be more temporary, um, unemployed or underemployed. Um, if it's the pri if it's a two parent family, then the primary wage earner has to be unemployed or underemployed, and they have a technical definition of what underemployed is. Um, someone also has to be a California resident um, and a resident of the county where aid is received. So that's just something that people sometimes get confused about if like, say they've applied for social security or EDD benefits, and like maybe they live in like Watsonville, but they've applied in Gilroy for EDD. If they live in Watsonville, they have to apply for CalWORKS with Santa Cruz County. Um, so even though it's a state benefit, it's administered by the county you live in. Okay, so when we talk about who is eligible as an immigrant, um, there are kind of two buckets. Um, and these are terms of art qualified immigrants is like this list of federally eligible um, immigrants that get priority for federal benefits programs. Um, but then besides the qualified immigrants, you have other people who are eligible under state law. And so just because someone's not on the qualified list doesn't mean they're not eligible. I know that's very confusing and I wish they would call the qualified immigrants anything else <laughs> because we always run into people who get denied because they weren't on the qualified list. And so just know it's like a Venn diagram, qualified is here, eligible is here. They're very overlapping, but not totally the same. So who's on the qualified list though? People with green cards. Um, and most humanitarian immigrants. So refugees, asylees, um, folks with a T visa, which is for survivors of human trafficking, um, folks who have uh, status under the Violence Against Women Act as a battered spouse or child of a US citizen or permanent resident. Um, as soon as they have something called prima facie determination, um, they, they are eligible humanitarian parolees are eligible. So usually they have to have been granted parole for at least 12 months, 
um, but that 12 month requirement doesn't apply to Afghan parolees or Ukrainian parolees, which I know we are starting to see more and more of in our community. Um, it also doesn't, or I'm sorry, also on the list are special immigrant visa holders and special immigrant parolees, um, which are two statuses that are um, common for folks from Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, and I know, again, we have um, a number of those folks in our community. Um, other eligible immigrants who are not on the qualified list but still get CalWORKs people who are permanently residing under color of law, which is PRUCOL, which I'll say a little bit about, um, people who have T visas, or sorry, people who are applying for T visas, and people who are applying for U visas or who have U visas, okay? Um, so, sorry, I thought we had a slide on PRUCOL. I'll just say about PRUCOL is that, um, Permanently residing under color of law is anyone who has some sort of status that may not be like a permanent visa, but it means that the government is not going to deport them um, because often because they are in process of getting something. So an example might be someone who has applied for asylum and like they're not going to be deported until they get their court date, which could be like two years, five years from now. Um, that would be an example of someone who's procol, um, someone who has like an order of supervision or something like that, where they're checking in with USCIS. Um, okay. Let's see. So the assistance unit. Some people who live together must be in the assistance unit. Um, you can have people who live in the household who are not in the assistance unit. So let's say I rent a room with another family and my daughter and I live in half the house and our housemates live in the other half. We can all live together, but my daughter and I would be our own assistance unit. Um, so parents and minor children, if they live together, have to be in the same assistance unit. A parent who lives separate from their children not only does not need to be in the same assistance unit, but cannot be in the same assistance unit. So something that comes up a lot is like, who is actually living in the house? And as we probably know, sometimes, especially when families are in flux and dealing with crisis, that can be hard to pin down. Like somebody spending some nights here and some nights with another friend. Um, and so it is really important to pin down who lives there um, versus who just sometimes stays there. Um, some people can choose not to be in the assistance unit. So immigrant family members can choose to opt out. Um, even if they are parents and would normally be required to be in the unit. Um, step parents, whether they're immigrants or not, um, who do not have kids in common in the household, those step parents can either choose to be in the unit or not be in the unit. Um, a non parent caretaker can also choose to get aid just for the children. Um, and one of the reasons they might choose to do that. Um, is because then their income and resources don't count for financial eligibility. So let's say I am, I don't know, like a 26 year old who's just imagine, um, who's like 17 year old brother just came here from El Salvador and is in the process of getting SIJS um, and which is for, um, you know, unaccompanied youth who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected, um, and needs to stay with me. I could choose to apply to get CalWORKs for the both of us and get CalWORKs for two, but then they're going to look at my income and resources. If I have a job, but maybe I make enough to support myself, but not my little brother, I can choose to get CalWORKs just for him, and he will. we will get CalWORKs for one and it won't take my income into account at all, okay? Uh, depending on my immigration status, I also may not be eligible for CalWORKs. Let's say I'm undocumented um, and he's eligible. 
then in that case, my income just wouldn't be counted at all. When it's a parent who's undocumented, then their, their income does count in a very particular way. Um, let's see. The, the scenario we often see with a non-parent caretaker is like grandchildren living with grandma or aunt or uncle, um, those sorts of situations. Okay. All right, so uh, income, and as I said, one of the eligibility factors is how poor do you have to be? Um, so there's basically, the when you apply you have to meet the gross income test and so it's based on the number of people living or that are in the assistance unit um, and there is a limit for each person i'm not going to specifically go through each one um, but these are the current amounts for the gross income. And then there is a different amount for recipients. So people who are already receiving CalWORKs, um, and that's going to be counted income, and it has to be under the following amount. And again, that's based on the number of people in the assistance unit, and um, it changes the amount of aid people receive based on what their countable income is. And these numbers, I'll just say, change annually. So these are what they are right now. If you look at these slides a year from now, the numbers will be different. Um, OK, so what counts? And like I said, there are it's different for people who are applying versus people who are recipients and already receiving CalWORKs. Um, but for applicants, um, you need to look at their gross income and then you would eliminate any excluded income. And then you subtract $600 from their gross earned income and the remainder of what's left is the countable um, income for applicants. Uh, for recipients, you would eliminate any excluded or exempt income. Um, any unearned income, all of that would count. Uh, unearned income is things like SSI um, and I believe uh, child support payments as well, Lisa. So unearned income would be anything that doesn't come from work. So like, yeah, people with SS who get SSI are not eligible to be in the CalWORKs household, um, but it would be things like social security insurance or um, like unemployment insurance, EDD benefits. Um, uh, you can also have things like foster benefits would count. Um, yeah, the main one we see is child support, child support or spousal support. Um. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, after you, after going through the unearned income, any unearned disability income, um, you subtract it to $600. Unearned or earned income, you subtract the remainder of what was left of that $600. So let's say someone gets $400 of disability income, you would subtract that and then there's 200 left and then you subtract that from the earned income and whatever is left is what would count as uh, income for a recipient. Um, I know going through the calculations like this is, in my mind, I. I'm a very visual person, but um, so I will tell people like, generally I don't think the people in this training are going to be doing these calculations, but this is just an explanation of if you get someone and they wanna know if they're eligible, this is just kind of a general run through of what people would be looking at. Yeah, the, the main takeaway for this group is that earned income you can have more in earned income 
um, and qualify, but unearned income, like if someone gets a lot of child support, like let's say it's a family of two and they get a thousand a month of child support, they may not be eligible where you have someone who makes a thousand dollars of earned income and they are eligible. So just know that like the rules are different for earned and unearned income and that, and the same for applicants and recipients. Someone may not be eligible to get on the program, but someone else with that same amount of income who is already on the program may be eligible to stay. Um, so this just kind of helps like you to understand if you, you're looking at two different people and you're like, why, why does this person get on and this person doesn't? Or the question clients always ask me is like, well, I know my neighbor makes this much. And so like, how come they get it and I don't? And, you know, it's like taxes or something. <laughs> you know, everybody's got different deductions and um, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, so examples of excluded income. So the main ones I think that you will probably see are um, $100 of child support um, passed through 200 child support passed through for two or more children, um, work study, educational loans and grants, um, in-kind support from nonprofit organizations. Uh, so, you know, if there is an organization that's maybe giving rental support um, or utility support, things like that, that is gonna be excluded income. Uh, I also on here in-kind item of partial need such as rental help um, again, those things are going to be excluded. And I think those will probably be the most common things that we see. Yes. So if, you, if someone's getting rental assistance from like season of sharing or sacred heart or something like that, and it's causing problems with their CalWORKs, that's, for them. that's a common error for eligibility workers not to realize that's excluded. So definitely something to refer to us. Um, another thing that comes up for immigrants is um, people who have a work or family-based visa um, who got their green card through a family member may have an immigration sponsor. Um, and that, person that sponsors income can be deemed or counted towards the immigrant, um, even if they don't live together. Um, and so they do need to provide, if they have an immigration sponsor, they do need to provide that person's name and contact info if they have it. Um, there are some exemptions or exceptions that people can qualify for if their sponsor is abusive, um, or if their sponsor has abandoned them and they don't know where that person is. Um, so that's another common thing where like we get involved. Um, just know that if someone has a sponsor, they may get asked questions about it. And if the sponsor is causing them not to be eligible, that is also something that is definitely worth a second look um, because we very often like catch where like someone's eligible for an exception that the eligibility worker didn't flag. Um, there's also, um, I will just say, because this is common with the Afghan arrivals and the Ukrainian arrivals, some refugees have like a refugee sponsor, which like could be like a church or like a community member. Those refugee sponsors are not counted at all. Um, they sign a different type of like contract with the government um, that does not count their income for purposes of public benefits. Um, so I have seen that come up and get confused where the eligibility worker just assumes everybody has a family-based visa. They ask them for their sponsor's name and they tell them the name of their like refugee sponsor and then the case kind of like goes off the rails. Um, so just be aware if someone, um, you know, has a refugee sponsor, that's not a problem. 
Okay. So in addition to income, they do have a property limit. This is a major change from years past. The property limit used to be $2,000 just a few years ago. The property limit is now $10,211 um, for most families or $15,317 for families with a member who is disabled or over age 60. So that's a significant difference. Any property that the family owns that has monetary value, like their bank account, um, or uh, like if they owned real estate property that they didn't live in, um, if they have multiple vehicles, that sort of thing, can be counted towards the resource limit with some exceptions. Um, the main rule though, is it has to be actually available. Um, so here are some examples of things that don't count. Um, the home where the family resides, if they're lucky enough to actually own a home, um, that doesn't count. Like their furniture, clothes, household goods, electronics, none of that counts. Um, tools needed for work. Um, and in a domestic violence situation, anything that's like community property that requires the consent of the abuser. Um, especially if like there's a divorce going on and they're like prohibited from disposing of the resources. Um, the car value has also changed significantly. Just a few years ago, it was, it had to be like less than $3,000, which you can imagine what a $3,000 car, how reliable that is. Um, and it really caused a lot of problems for families um, because basically they were constantly unable to you know, get to work, get to childcare, get to school. Um, now a car valued up to $25,000 is exempt totally. Um, and it will also be exempt regardless of value if it is used to transport a disabled household member, used as a home. Unfortunately, that's one that applies to a lot of people. Um, used to transport heating, fuel, or water, um, used for employment, or was received as a gift or donation or family transfer. Okay. So we talked a little about the income and resource rules and kind of who um, gets to receive CalWORKs. So now we're gonna introduce Gloria um, who we're going to be following throughout this training. All right. So this is the first of many scenarios. Uh, Gloria is a 30 year old who came to the US. Uh, and uh, she came to the US four years ago to join her sister, Anna. During the pandemic, Anna left to take a job in Texas and she never came back. Now Gloria is working part time as a waitress and she also takes care of Anna's three year old daughter Sophia. Gloria loves Sophia, but her income isn't steady and she worries about whether she can afford to raise her alone. Okay, so we're going to try and launch our poll questions. So let's see. First question, can Gloria get CalWORKs for Sophia? I'm just gonna give each one a few seconds. Okay, I think we've got a good Okay, so we have, it's about a split. Um, a few people think no, because Gloria is not Sophia's mother. Um, remember CalWORKs, it's families with children, but you need an adult caretaker relative. Um, and since Gloria is Sophia's aunt, she counts as that adult caretaker relative. So even though she's not a, a mother, that's not a problem. 
Um, and then we have a split as to whether Gloria's income needs to be low enough um, or whether Gloria's income doesn't matter. And in some ways, both groups are right. So if Gloria wants to be in the unit, then Gloria's income needs to be low enough. But even if Gloria's income is too high for her to get CalWORKs for herself, she can get CalWORKs for Sophia as a non-needy caretaker relative. Um, and that can be really helpful because a lot of times we have like a working caretaker who is just making enough to not qualify for themselves. Um, but that extra CalWORKs amount can be really helpful. Okay, so second question. Oh, sorry, Did, was everybody able to see those results? Did I share those? Okay. Now, okay. Can Gloria get CalWORKs for herself? Okay, we have about two thirds of folks answering. Okay, are you able to see that? Um, so we have a number of folks. Again, we have like some folks who say only if she's an eligible non citizen. And then we have like a number of folks who say, Okay, only if she has low enough income. A few folks who think she needs to get legal custody of Sophia, and about half of you think all of the above. So this is a little bit of a trick question. Um, we didn't wanna make the polling questions too easy, otherwise people will go to sleep. Um, so she does need to have low enough income if she wants to get CalWORKs for herself, that's true. Uh, she does need to be an eligible non-citizen. Um, she came to the country, so we're assuming she's not a citizen to start with. Um, so she needs to be an eligible non-citizen to get it for herself. She doesn't need to get legal custody of Sophia. Um, there might be other reasons she wants to get legal custody of Sophia, and it would be helpful for her to do that, but it's not a requirement of CalWORKs. Um, and unfortunately, that is something that we see people incorrectly denied CalWORKs for if they're not the parent. Um, we've definitely seen a grandma or an aunt told, oh, if you want CalWORKs, you have to go get legal custody. And that's, that's not, in fact, the rule. So um, all of the above, you were really close. It was two out of the three um, that they needed to do. Okay. Okay. Oh, more polling questions. Okay, so. Um, Gloria could not get CalWORKs for herself due to her immigration status, but she was able to get CalWORKs for Sophia. Last month, she lost her job after her abusive boyfriend caused a scene at the restaurant. Today, she found out she's pregnant. So will the baby be able to get CalWORKs? Okay. Again, a good split. I'm glad that nobody picked no because Gloria is undocumented. We do have folks out in the community who are afraid they can't get CalWORKs for their children because of their own status. 
Um, but no, we don't, we don't judge a child's eligibility based on their parent status. So um, the child will be eligible when they are born. Okay. If Gloria has a qualifying immigration status and meets the income guidelines, she herself could get CalWORKs as a pregnant person for herself, but she wouldn't get CalWORKs for two, like for the baby, um, not until the baby is born. Okay. Um, next polling question. Sorry, I keep giving explanations that give away the next question. <laughs> when I'm in poll mode, I can't see all the questions at once. Okay. I'm just gonna share the results. Um, okay, so for herself, because she's already a caretaker relative for Sophia, whether the baby is born or not doesn't matter for, um, for Gloria. If Gloria lived alone, it would be just as soon as she was pregnant that she would count as a caretaker. Um, but we do need to um, have some sort of immigration status. Um, and we are going to talk about um, if her abusive boyfriend caused the scene at the restaurant. Um, she may be a survivor of domestic violence. She may be eligible for something called a U visa. Um, I wish we had a poll question for who has heard of a U visa, um, but this is a very common visa for victims of crime, um, and one of the qualifying crimes is domestic violence and stalking, um, and so it sounds like she may be eligible for a U visa. If she's filed that, then she would be eligible for CalWORKs for herself. Okay, um, and I think that's the end of our questions about this round of Gloria. You can see Gloria is going to have a rough time of it this training. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to talk about welfare to work now. And so this is one of the things that uh, recipients need to do in order to keep receiving CalWORKs benefits. Okay. All right, so what is welfare to work? Um, recipients of the CalWORKs program need to be engaged in job readiness activities. They need to be working or working. Um, Job readiness activities are things like getting a GED, going to college, getting higher education, job skills classes, or being enrolled in ESL classes. Um, there are also rules about uh, recipients receiving therapy and DV services being considered job readiness activities. Uh, adults that are not receiving CalWORKs that are in the home but not in the assistance unit are not going to be required to participate in welfare to work. The required hours for these activities change um, based on the child's age and the number of parents in the assistance unit. Um, so if it's one parent with a child under the age of six, then they're going to be required to do 
20 hours a week of either working or job readiness activities. Um, that goes up to 30 hours a week if the child is six or older. And if there's two parents in the home, it's 35 hours a week. Um, if the recipient adult in the home uh, does not participate in the welfare to work program, they can be sanctioned. Um, and when they receive these sanctions, it reduces the aid that they're receiving. Uh, so there are people who can be exempt from the welfare to work program. And so some of those people are people over the age of 60, people who have a DV waiver, um, people who have a disability or someone who's pregnant or caring for a child under the age of two. Uh, there can also be an exemption for people who are volunteering to, um, to participate in full or partial hours. So there's no sanctions for volunteers um, and volunteers should be able to get childcare funding, transportation and any other supportive services that CalWORKs offers. So it can often be really useful for someone if they can work, wanna work, but like have some limitations or have some challenges participating. If they qualify for a waiver, um, to get that waiver and then participate as a volunteer because um, then they don't have to worry about the sanctions. Um, okay. CalWORKs rules for survivors of abuse. I believe this is me, right, Juliana? Yes. Um, okay, so family violence options. Um, say that the county welfare departments must identify applicants for CalWORKs who are abuse victims while protecting um, their eligibility and refer people to DV supportive services. Um, they also have to waive any program requirements for as long as necessary if the rules would make it harder to escape abuse or unfairly penalize the family for the abuse. Um, the only things they can't waive, they can't change like the financial eligibility criteria. Um, they also can't waive de deprivation. So unfortunately, that means if someone is still, let's say it's a two parent family, um, one parent is the abuser, the other parent is the victim, and the victim wants to apply for CalWORKs, they can't exclude the abuser just because they're abusive as long as they are living together. But there are new rules. It used to be that they had to be living apart for a certain amount of time to show that the abuser was no longer in the household. Um, now the rules allow that like, if I want to leave my abuser and I need CalWORKs in order to do that, like I can apply for CalWORKs today the day I am leaving my abuser. So like I can arrange to go into shelter today and um, use the CalWORKs. We're gonna talk about some resources that help people get temporary shelter using CalWORKs. Um, and as of today, the abuser, like the day I'm separating, the abuser's income and resources don't count and I don't need to get their signature on anything. So that can be a really helpful thing for families because we know that financial dependence on the abuser is one of the main things that keeps people from being able to escape. In terms of how the county can ask someone to prove that they are a survivor of abuse, um, we hear sometimes that people are told they need to get a police report or they need to get a restraining order. Those can be proof of abuse, but they're just one example. Um, uh, any documentation from a DV agency or legal aid that they're getting services related to abuse. Um, but more importantly, the, the client's own sworn statement should be sufficient um, unless there's a, a reason, an independent, reasonable basis for finding the recipient not credible. And I've never actually seen the county do that. Um, they absolutely cannot and will not 
contact the abuser to collaborate to corroborate um sorry that should be corroborating info um to corroborate that the abuse has taken place i know sometimes clients are scared of that like if i apply for calworks will they contact the abuser um, when people are asking for a waiver of the rules, like say you're asking for a waiver of the welfare to work participation rule based on DV, um, just know that there's no like set form, there's no time limit. Um, we do encourage people to ask in writing um, because that makes it just easier to prove that they've requested it. Um, there is normally a 60 month time limit for adults on the program, but months where they have a DV waiver don't count. Um, they can also get a DV waiver after their 60 months have already run out. Um, and the county should issue a notice of action, either approving or denying the DV waiver. And if they deny it, that's something the family can approve. So a family that's a DV survivor that needs a waiver, if it gets denied, that just know that that's not the end of the road. Um, that's also something that we help people with regularly. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to Gloria. Okay. Okay, so Gloria is now caring for her niece, Sophia, who's four now and her new baby. She's filed for a U visa, but doesn't have a work permit. With two little ones, she hasn't been able to find work or attend the welfare to work activities. She just got a notice her CalWORKs will go down because she missed her ESL class. Okay, so. Polling question next. What can Gloria do about the sanction? I should have had a fourth answer, which was give up, because that is what most recipients do when they get a sanction. Um, but I know if you guys are working with someone, you're going to talk to them. There are things you can do if you get a sanction. Great. We've got most people have jumped in. Um, and most people are right. So she could either ask for an exemption because she has a child under two or because she is a survivor of domestic violence. Um, I would personally recommend for her to do the domestic violence one because the child under two, I think you only get to use that like once in your lifetime. So if she had a second child later on, she might need to use that one. Um, but yeah, either one of those would get her um, ex exempted from welfare to work. And then if she could do partial hours, let's say she wants to do some work, um, they should be able to like provide her um, childcare and things. Um, I threw in the one about because she doesn't have a work permit. So some people who have applied for the use visa will have work permits and some will not. Um, if she doesn't have an exemption, they can still require her to participate but they can't obviously force her to work if she's not legally authorized to do so, but they could assign her like ESL classes or school or job training, things like that. Um, and she can volunteer for those things as well. Um, a lot of folks on CalWORKs use it as an opportunity to get like credits at community college towards a career goal. Um, and that can be really, really, um, excellent way to use the program to help increase your future economic um, stability. Okay. And let's see. Um, I did want to just really quickly mention there was a comment about the prior examples and um, 
Gloria, what, like what, why why it kept um, mentioning like oh it's like if Gloria's in the third trimester or not. The reason we put that in as a little bit of a red herring is because people often fixate on which stage of pregnancy people are at. And because that used to matter for whether the adult themselves were eligible for CalWORKs, um, if there were no other children, if the only way they qualified as a caretaker was because they're pregnant. Um, we just want you guys to know that it no longer matters what stage of the pregnancy. So. If someone, if I am pregnant and I already have a kid, well, I'm eligible because I already have a kid. If I'm pregnant and don't already have a kid, I can be eligible based on my pregnancy, whether I'm in first trimester or second or third trimester, okay? But I do still need to meet other criteria such as the non-citizen eligibility and the financial eligibility. So think of eligibility as like all these layers and you have to be able to cross each one. So I have to meet the financial, I have to meet the non-citizen, I have to meet the caretaker relative definition and um, when I'm on the program, I have to meet the welfare to work participation or some exception from it. Okay. So we're trying to like kind of layer and build our familiarity with the program here. Okay. So what, what yeah, what can you get besides regular cash aid? So uh, the CalWORKs program does provide other services and benefits besides just the regular cash aid. Uh, so welfare to work supportive services, these can include things like counseling, such for DV or drug and alcohol abuse, they can provide transportation costs. So if you need help with, you know, let's say a bus pass or something like that, uh, these supportive services can help with that. If you need clothing, a uniform or any tools for your job, uh, you can apply for supportive services to help with those things, licensing fees, uh, books or supplies. So if you need books or supplies for school, um, you can have support for those as well. And I will just note, these are things that a lot of people on the CalWORKs program don't know about. Uh, so you know, if you have clients that are receiving CalWORKs, encourage them to use these supportive services. They're really beneficial and they can be really helpful uh, to people being able to keep their jobs or, you know, continue receiving CalWORKs. And for, for folks participating in school, um, in addition to books and supplies, they can also cover fees. So they won't cover the tuition itself, but like if there's a student fee or a lab fee or something like that else, else they can um, they can they can cover any required fees. Child care. Uh, so this is huge. I mean, we know that most people that are on CalWORKs have children. It's one of the eligibility requirements. Um, so one of the supportive services that is offered is childcare. Um, so immediate and continuous availability from the time of application. So let's say you, your client applies for CalWORKs, um, immediately upon applying for CalWORKs, they should become eligible for this child care. And the child care supportive services can actually continue for two or more years after someone is off of CalWORKs. Um, so this is a supportive service that starts from the beginning and continues long after or can continue long after someone is no longer on the CalWORKs program. Um, during parent participation and welfare to work activities, um, such as school or job training, they can use these child care services. Um, and they can also use the child care services during CalWORKs orientation activities. So these are services that are available and people should 
take advantage of them because we all know childcare is expensive um, and it can be a huge barrier to people participating in these programs. So uh, special situations, uh, CalWORKs diversion, uh, a payment. So a payment or service is issued for CalWORKs applicants to help a family. Um, basically what this is, is instead of actually becoming a recipient and receiving CalWORKs monthly, uh, you can apply for basically a one-time payment. Um, and this can be really helpful for a family that needs, you know, just a lump sum in order to pay rent one month. Um, and so that's that's what we're talking about here about the CalWORKs diversion. Um, there can be non reoccurring special needs. Um, and so this can be a lump sum of up to $600. And then the last special situation that we're going to talk about is going to be the ancillary services. Um, yeah, so these would be any any items needed to participate in welfare to work. Um, some examples, which we think maybe people might come across from this training are diapers. Um, so let's say your child is in childcare and one of the things that the childcare uh, requires is that you provide diapers for your child in order to attend childcare. Um, one of the special services is that they will actually provide diapers for those children so those children can continue to go to child care. Um, <clears throat> another thing is they will pay fees for an ID or work permit. And these are things that we've noticed are underutilized or that people don't realize are available when they are receiving CalWORKs benefits. Yeah, and, and for these and other supportive services, I just answered a question in the chat about like how someone gets them. So the county is not going to inquire and ask, like, do you need diapers so that your kid can go to childcare? So it is something that people need to ask for. Um, you know, in an ideal world, caseloads would be low enough that the worker would have time to like really, you know, ask all those questions. But there are so many things covered. Uh, yeah, it really helps if people ask. Um, usually they can ask their welfare to work worker, who's called their employment services worker. Um, if they are earlier in the process and just applying for CalWORKs, um, the person they're talking to is usually the eligibility worker. Um, and they can ask that person as well. Um, as always, if they can ask in writing, it's nice to do so, so that they have proof. Um, but it's not required. Um, okay, so immediate needs processing. This is for initial applicants. So when someone initially applies for CalWORKs, um, they can request immediate need processing. Uh, and so basically they need to have an emergency need for the CalWORKs to start. Um, so examples would be, they have an immediate need or emergency need for shelter or medical care. Um, they're victims of domestic violence or they're being evicted from their home. Uh, they need to appear to be eligible. They need to have $100 or less in cash or liquid resources. And they, the needs cannot be met by other community agencies. Um, you can get up to $200 that same day, their application will be processed within 15 days. Um, and if there is an eviction notice that the family currently has, they should receive a full grant in three days. And I apologize, there's one more update that I forgot to add to this slide. So that $100 or less, um, if they're getting evicted, they just have to have less than the amount that they need to stop the eviction. So if they're if they owe like three thousand dollars in back rent and they have two hundred or sorry two thousand nine hundred dollars, 
um, they could still qualify for immediate need. The magic words, they need to ask for immediate need and tell them they are being evicted. Okay. So um, there was a related question in the chat about some of the homeless assistance that is available. Um, there are a number of different types of homeless assistance that are available from CalWORKs. And um, a lot of money in the most recent budget just went into shoring up the amounts available for families. So I would say if you are working with a family with children and they are in need of housing support and financial assistance, look to CalWORKs first whenever possible. Um, because those pots of money are reserved for those families with children. Um, they are, they have the right to those funds if they are eligible. And there is more in those pots per eligible family than there are in some of the other pots of money available, such as things like season of sharing. So, um, look to CalWORKs first. Um, it also comes with some really good support services that can help stabilize people. So when we talk about homeless assistance for families in CalWORKs, they're gonna use the broader um, kind of think of it, I think of it as like the McKinney-Vento definition. Um, so it includes families that are like doubled up, families that are like renting someplace that's not fit for, you know, that's not designed for human habitation. Um, like we know we have families who are like renting garages or things like that, um, as well as folks who are unsheltered, as well as folks who are living in cars, um, folks who are couch sur surfing. And people can get this homeless assistance from CalWORKs once every 12 months. And they can get it more than once every 12 months if one of these exceptions apply. So the big one right now is disaster. COVID itself is a disaster. So if people need the homeless assistance more than once every 12 months because of COVID, that's something they can get through CalWORKs. Whereas I know a lot of other resources are still once in a lifetime. Um, they can also get it more than once every 12 months if their homelessness is related to DV. Okay. Um, so there's a few different types of homeless assistance. There's temporary homeless assistance, um, which can provide up to $85 a day for a motel for a family of four or less. And then that amount per day can go up depending on the size of the family up to $145 a day. Um, and they can get that temporary homeless assistance up to 16 days in a row. They have to be provided that money the same day they ask for it. And that includes new CalWORKs applicants. So if you are dealing with a family that is like critically unhoused and needs a place to stay tonight, if they are apparently eligible for CalWORKs, meaning you've got an adult caretaker, you've got minor kids, they are roughly under the income limits they should be able to get that assistance same day and for up to 16 days. Um, in addition, if their housing need is related to um, fleeing abuse, they can get an additional 16 nights. So they could get up to 32 nights. So this is a really good resource. I know we have some good DV shelters in town, but there are times that they are full up um, and so if you have a family that cannot get into shelter for one reason or another, this is a really good way to keep them housed for up to a month while they wait for that shelter to open up. Okay. In addition to that temporary homeless assistance, there is permanent homeless assistance. This can pay for um, a way to keep the, the family housed on a more permanent basis. It is not that the assistance itself lasts permanently. So I just wanna make that distinction, but it can pay for a security deposit and last month's rent on new housing. Let's say the family got evicted, but they've located housing that is affordable to them. It can pay the move-in money. Um, 
they do have to show that they'll be able to afford the rent going forward. So they have to show that the rent is going to be 80% or less of the total household income. Um, the county can also pay up to two months of back rent to prevent an eviction. And that is something that's really helpful, especially as like the, the um, COVID related back rent assistance runs out. Um, and families may have been getting that assistance, but maybe there's a gap now because that ended in, I think it was March. Um, and now they owe money for like April and May, let's say. Um, they must receive this money one business day after they ask for it, um, as long as they are on CalWORKs. Okay. There's also, in addition to the homeless, um, the traditional temporary and permanent homeless assistance, there's some newer services called the Family Services Program, FSP, and part of that is the Housing Support Program, HSP. So the Family Services Program is like a kind of like an umbrella term for a lot of like case management um, that families can opt into. Um, that's designed to help families experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness with sort of wraparound services. Um, I don't know if some of the folks even in this training may be um, part of the provision network for those FSP services, um, but it's voluntary. It follows a housing first model um, and the housing support program specifically, it's a little different in each county. In Santa Clara County, our HSP can provide short-term rental assistance, security deposits, utility payments, and even renter's insurance if that is required by the landlord, um, as well as hotel and motel vouchers, moving costs, housing navigation services, um, intensive case management, um, some legal services and credit repair. And they also have some employment incentives. So like they have like matching programs for families that have someone working. Um, so that can be really, really useful. Like I could see a, a flow if a family comes to me in crisis and maybe they have children, maybe they're fleeing domestic violence, getting them that temporary homeless assistance so they're sheltered tonight. Um, if we're able to find them a spot in a subsidized apartment they can afford, great, get that permanent homeless assistance. If not, immediate self-referral to the HSP to try and get this other assistance, like including the housing navigation and the case management um, and the employment incentives. Okay. Um, Juliana, I see that there's a lot in the chat. I don't know if there's anything that you wanna um throw out here so there was just a question um about if, if people can walk in or if they need to make appointments to meet with a calworks eligibility worker um and i i already responded in the chat but for people who weren't reading in the chat the social services offices are open to walk-ins again um so people can physically walk into any social social services office and can apply for CalWORKs in person. Um, people can also apply by calling in over the phone or applying on the internet on mycalwin.org if that is easier for people. Yeah, I would say if someone needs same day or next day assistance, they should walk into the office um, and be really clear like I coach people, you need to say immediate need, you need to say homeless assistance, you need to say you're being evicted. Um, and then we got another question about the maximum amount of rental assistance that people can receive. So for the permanent homeless assistance, if it's for back rent, it's up to two months of back rent, but there's not a specific numerical cap. Um, as long as the amount of rent going forward is affordable to the family and using the term affordable loosely, that the family, it's under 80% of the family's income. Um, 
for these other like short term rental assistance, like how long that is currently lasting in Santa Clara County, I don't have that information. Um, but I think last I heard it was around six months um, that they were providing that rental assistance. It may be more or less right now. Um, and it may vary somewhat depending on kind of how many families they have. But I know that more, more state money was put into that pot for families to operate these programs. Um, okay. um, we are getting more questions in the chat. We were asked to provide the phone number link and address to the social service office. Um, I will just note there are multiple social services offices and there's gonna be different ones closer to different people. Um, so I, I could, but there are lots of social services offices offices. So I would recommend that if someone's looking for one that they can just type it into Google and find their local closest office. Um, yeah, even better than Google, there's on the social services website, it lists the locations of the CalWORKs offices. Um, I believe 1867 is the main one on Center Road. They're all clustered very close together on Center Road, um, as well as one in Mountain View and one in um, Gilroy. Um, so people can walk into any of those CalWORKs offices to apply. Um, as far as what verifications they need, so for the temporary homeless assistance, that 16 night, they don't need to have any of their verifications done in order to get that, but they will need to provide them eventually. I think earlier in the slides, we had a list of the like sample types of verifications, um, but they can vary a little bit based on the families individual circumstances so I don't have like a total complete list the main ones IDs if they have them social security numbers if they have them they don't need the card um, birth certificates for kids if they have them to prove like who's related um, and proof of any income so like bank statements or social security notices if that's income they get or um, bank statements are pay usually stub. how they prove child support, pay stubs, things like that. Um, if they are getting homeless assistance based on an eviction, I would have them bring any paperwork they have related to that. Um, but for the emergency processing, they should be able to start it before they have everything together. Okay. Okay. And the last question we just got, Lisa, is if individuals can get CalWORK services at the GA office. So if there are children in the family, the, the family should be going to the CalWORKs office, not the GA office. Um, they are like right across the street from each other. And you can't get both GA and CalWORKs. You're going to be on one program or the other. Um, and any family that has children should be getting CalWORKs and not GA. The CalWORKs grant is much higher than that GA grant is going to be. And there are much better services for families um, with CalWORKs than GA. What is the difference? Are you asking the difference between GA and CalWORKs? I just want to... Um, GA is general assistance, and it is a program designed for individuals who um, need financial assistance. It's also considered a loan. Um, our so county not, doesn't treat it as one, but yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's not a loan in Santa Clara County. It is a program of last resort for people who don't qualify for other programs. So if you don't qualify for CalWORKs because you don't have kids, if you don't qualify for Social Security or CAPI because you're not disabled or you're not aged. Um, so it's primarily single adults 18 to 64 who are on GA. Um, if you have a family with kids and they say they're on GA, they're probably really on CalWORKs or something is very wrong. Um, the county messed up. Yeah, or the family didn't mention the fact that they have children. They had, yeah, they miss. They applied for the wrong program or whatever it may okay. be. Okay. Okay. Should we go back to Gloria? Yes. Poor Gloria. 
Things are looking up. Right. She got a job. Yeah. Uh, Gloria got a job under the table cleaning an office building. She and the children had been staying with friends, but had to move. So right now, the three of them are sleeping in the office building where Gloria works. Gloria's immigration lawyer said she should get a work permit soon, but she doesn't know if she can last that long. Okay. And I just have to say, Gloria's story is a composite of numerous clients that I have had, but every single fact in here is a scenario that I have seen personally. So I'm not just, I'm not just heaping misfortune upon her. Um, okay. So what housing help might CalWORKs give the family? Great to see we have so many people still participating in the polls. That means you haven't slipped out to multitasking or fallen asleep yet. So thank you. Um, okay, so yes, everybody's right. Everybody's right. Um, I think the ones that we might think of immediately are temporary homeless assistance and then probably the housing support assistance. Uh, I'm sorry, the ho housing support program, uh, the permanent homeless assistance. If we identify a place for Gloria to live, that may be something they can get. Right now, they're not actively being evicted from somewhere and they don't have new housing lined up. So I can see why fewer people picked that on its own. Um, but yeah, all of these are available to the family. Um, Okay. Okay. All right, so keeping your cow works. So in order to continue receiving benefits uh, through cow works, you do, do need to do things other than what we've already talked about with welfare to work. So semi-annual reporting. So what this is, is there is a redetermination that happens annually to determine if families remain and continue to be eligible for the CalWORKs program. There is a report that they call a SAR-7, which is a form. And this it's a report of changes that happen every six months. So the family will be sent this form in the mail and they need to complete this form for any changes in income um, or family size, uh, among a number of other things that are on the form, but they need to report those things. Uh, families have to report any reasonably anticipated income and anything that may change their eligibility. So reasonably anticipated income is kind of a, um, this concept that the county uses uh, to determine what needs to be reported to them as income. So let's say someone receives one giant lump sum payment of like a workers comp settlement but they don't know when they're going to get it they don't know the exact amount that it's going to be um that's not going to be reasonably anticipated that's something that they can report after they get it um but it's not going to be reasonably anticipated that they need to pre-report that they're getting it because that will affect their eligibility, um, but they're not going to know when they're getting it and the exact amount that they're getting it in. Um, a grant amount stays the same for six months, so once you submit that SAR-7, they're going to, you know, recalculate your benefits and then your grant amount will remain the same for six months unless your income goes over the income 
reporting threshold, which is called an IRT. Um, and so if someone's income goes above the IRT, they do need to report it to CalWORKs. So their grant can be adjusted. If they fail to report it, um, they can later receive an overpayment and have to pay the county back for benefits they received. Um, report everything, even if you're not sure if you need to report it. Um, and we prefer and always tell people to report things in writing. If you have your eligibility workers email address, send them an email, send them a letter in the mail, um, because sometimes things get lost. Uh, sometimes things don't get entered into the system timely. So it's best if people try to report things in writing so they have that documentation that they did report things. I just want to, I know that IR, the income reporting threshold is kind of confusing. It's the most confusing thing to clients. Um, but I, just to give like a really basic example, let's say my hours fluctuate and this month on my, the month that I have to fill out my report, I make $1,500. And based on my family size, they'll tell me like, okay, your income reporting threshold is $1,800. So basically it means they're going to calculate my grant based on the $1,500 of income I reported. And for the next six months, as long as my income stays under $1,800, I don't have to report changes and I don't, you know, my CalWORKs won't change. But if let's say, you know, so if it goes up to 16 or $1,700, I'm fine. If my income goes up to $2,000 though, it's over that income reporting threshold. I do need to report that before my next six months. Um, but the most important thing is people make sure to like accurately report on those six month reports um, and to know what their income reporting threshold is. And I will also note like if your income does fluctuate like that. If you do go over, you should report it, but you should also let the eligibility worker know, hey, next month, you know, I don't think my hours will be as high because, again, it's, it's also about reasonably anticipated income. Um, so all the rules kind of interplay and it makes the program extra complicated. And if there's any issues with someone that one of your clients is having with these rules um, and let's say they receive an overpayment notice or anything like that, you can refer them to us. Um, that is something we would be more than happy to look at and help people with. Yeah, countable income, calculating income, overpayments, those are very common issues for us to help people with. Um, okay. All right, so what sort of changes should a household report? Um, changes to the people in the home. So if someone moves out of the home or someone moves into the home, um, that 51% rule of thumb. So, you know, your brother lives with you, you know, five days out of the week. Um, I guess your brother is not actually in the assistance unit. Your child uh, is now in the custody of their father 40% um, of the time um, before they were with you 100% of the time. You're going to need to report that change. Um, if you move, you should report your change of address. That way you can make sure you're getting all your letters in the mail, change in immigration status. Um, you know, mom or dad who is the parent, if their immigration status changes and they're now an eligible non-citizen, they may want to become part of the assistance unit, uh, which could potentially raise that grant that the family is receiving change in student status. Um, so someone is enrolled in school and they're now not enrolled in school or something along those lines, you're going to need to report 
those things, disability status, if a member of the household becomes disabled, um, you're going to want to report that. Changes to money, um, if your income goes up and down, if your work hours go up or your work hours go down, um, your household gets an asset or some sort of property um, or your household sells an asset or some sort of property. These are all things that could end up affecting a household or an assistance unit's benefits. Child support cooperation. Um, so this is a big one that we see um, people having issues with this. So a recipient um, must assign child support to the county. So when someone applies for CalWORKs, they, I believe they sign a form allowing the county to um, basically seek child support. Um, and so they need to cooperate with the county in establishing paternity and enforcing any child support orders. Uh, there are good cause waivers for this child support cooperation. Um, and so some things that we, we want to point your attention to are increased risk of abuse to the parent or child. Um, so if someone's in a DV situation and seeking child support, we'll notify that abusive parent of someone's location or that they're even participating in the CalWORKs program, uh, you can get a waiver for that. The child was conceived as a result of rape or incest and any other reason that's in the child's best interest um, to waive this child support cooperation. And if there is any issues um, with getting that waived, you can always contact us and we would be happy to work with the county in order to get that waiver. I'll just flag that the, the amount of the pass through of child support, which is the amount of, of the child support that goes directly to the household and doesn't count as income, um, that has increased. It used to be $50, regardless of how many children the child support was for. Now, if it's the child support for one child, you get $100. And if it's child support for two or more children, you get the first $200 they collect. OK. Is this one me? Yes. So um, I mentioned briefly back a little while ago that there is this 60-month limit for adults. TANF, the federal name, for it is temporary assistance for needy families. Um, so the temporary is because adults are limited to 60 months on aid. And that is a recent change. For years and years, the time limit for adults was 60 months. Then during the recession of 2008, 9, 10, they lowered it to kick adults off after 48 months. And now they just increased it to 60 months again. Um, so folks who may have timed out at 48 months may now be eligible again. Um, so if you have a family where they have kids and the kids are getting CalWORKs, but mom or dad says, oh, I'm not, I'm not eligible, I timed out, they may now be eligible again. Um, they're supposed to pick those cases up automatically, but we know that there will be like data errors in their computer system. Um, so definitely people should ask about that if they're not included in the unit. Um, there are also certain months that don't count towards that 60 month limit. So when people are unable to participate in welfare to work due to domestic violence, if people are disabled or injured for at least 30 days, that month doesn't count. If they're caring for a sick or disabled family member, if they're caring for a child under 24 months, or if the person is over age 60. None of those months count towards the 60 month. Um, they're also able, after the 60 month clock has run out, there are certain reasons they can still get aid. Those are called extensions. You don't really need to know the difference between exemptions and extensions. That's kind of like a wonky 
public benefits attorney thing. Um, but basically, yeah, there's good cause for people not to be subject to that time limit is basically what you just need to know. Um, also, they can untick months from your clock for months the county got child support. So that's another um, positive thing about getting that child support, even though it goes to the county. Okay. So back to Gloria. Gloria. So CalWORKS has told Gloria she needs to fill out paperwork for paternity and child support cases against Steve. She's scared of bringing Steve back into their lives when she finally feels safe. The last time she saw him, he saw her EBT card and threatened to turn her in for welfare fraud so she will get deported. He says he knows she can't be eligible because she has a job. We see this all the time where abusers think they know when someone is committing fraud. So what can Gloria do? Okay. So in reality, on my experience of working with DV survivors who are trying to access CalWORKS, I can tell you that what most survivors do if they are not given um, any counseling or information about their rights is the first thing. They quit CalWORKS so they don't have to deal with the abuser, unfortunately. Um, what we would like to get the message out about is that, yeah, they can ask for good cause. Now, the county is supposed to be asking when they have people fill out the child support paperwork if they need, you know, if they need good cause. Um, but we know in practice, you know, it's just, they're getting a lot of papers at once, the worker hands them this thing, the client doesn't read the fine print that talks about exceptions and the worker doesn't mention it out loud. Um, so making sure people know they can ask for a good cause. Um, they can also choose to fill out the paperwork. Um, the thing I would be concerned about is the, the threat of him making a fraud report is not, um, is not to be taken lightly. Pretty much every domestic violence family law case we have, um, our domestic violence attorneys tell me if the abuser knows that the other parent is on CalWORKS, they will threaten to report fraud. And mo many of the fraud cases we see start with a bogus report from an abuser or someone associated with the abuser. Um, so, it is just important for clients to think about that. On the other hand, she may really want the child support and believe that there will be a way to collect it from Steve. So the risk of him making this fraud report may be something she's willing to take on. But making sure clients have that information is important. Okay. Oops, sorry, I forgot to advance the slide. Um, okay. Another polling question. So is Steve's threat valid? Is Gloria committing welfare fraud?
Okay. So I'm glad that most of you know that CalWORKs recipients are allowed to work. It's right there in the name of the program. In fact, most people getting CalWORKs, like most people getting food stamps, like most people getting Medi-Cal, do have at least one person in the household working. Um, I think it's a common misconception that welfare programs and safety net programs are only for people who don't wanna work or can't work. Um, most households are working, at least some. Um, so it's definitely allowed. The question of whether she has a work permit and how that affects her CalWORKs is one I get asked a lot by clients. Um, the fact that she is working without a permit would not be fraud for CalWORKs purposes. It might violate civil immigration rules, but it is not fraud. As long as she is reporting her income accurately to CalWORKs, that is all CalWORKs cares about. It is really important that non-citizens who are working under the table, it's really important for them to report their earnings to CalWORKs, even if um, they're, you know, not working on the books, because not reporting your income will count as fraud. But CalWORKs doesn't care if you have a permit or not. Um, and there's actually data sharing privacy rules that make it illegal for eligibility workers to like report someone to ICE, for example, which is what some clients are afraid of. Um, so I think most of you got this, as long as she's reporting her earnings, even if she doesn't have a work permit, she's not committing fraud. But that's something that like abusers often like say like, oh, I know you're committing fraud because X, Y, and Z, and they don't know the rules. Um, so usually the client is not. Okay. All right. Overcoming barriers. Uh, this is something that a lot of people have trouble with. Um, so the application process, when someone applies, they can file a joint application for CalFresh, Medi-Cal, Cal, and CalWORKs using one form. They don't have to apply for each program separately. Uh, so, you know, it does make it just a little bit easier when they're able to apply for everything all at once. Um, like we said a little bit earlier, you can apply online at mybenefitscalwin.org, um, which, you know, encompasses all the programs they can apply for everything here, but we don't recommend that people use this online tool if the client is an immigrant other than a client or a person who's an LPR. Um, we also don't recommend it for people who are seeking emergency aid or homeless assistance. I actually don't think there's an option to like check a box or anything to notify the county that they're seeking emergency aid or seeking homeless assistance. Um, so in those cases, I think the fastest and best way to make sure that everything is processed quickly um, is to physically go to the office in person and do it there. Um, did you have something you wanted to add, Lisa? Um. No, I was just going to mention on the next bullet point, like the most common reason people get denied CalWORKs is just because they start the online application, but they don't follow up. Um, so when they do that online application, they will then get a call from somebody at the county to complete the process, to do a phone interview and to tell them what documentation they need. Um, and if people don't respond to that call or turn in the documentation, that is where most people fill, fall off the eligibility. Most people who are denied CalWORKs, it's not because they're not eligible. It's because they didn't finish jumping through the hoops. So here's right. that spot. Yeah, Someone here's that asking. list of um, 
documentation that people may need to provide. Um, the county can ask for proof. The things that they may ask for are proof of identity, um, which can be an ID card. They may ask for someone's social security number. They're not going to ask for an actual copy of the social, social, social security card. Um, if someone is not eligible yet for a social security number, um, they should not provide one to social services. Um, and social services cannot require that people who aren't yet eligible for a social security number provide one. Um, they may ask for a birth or marriage certificate. Uh, they could ask for someone's non-citizen status, housing and shelter costs, employment or other income. They could ask for bank account information, uh, the car's value or a copy of the car's title, student status. There's a bunch of other things that they could ask for. Um, I will just note that it is important for people to provide their housing and shelter cost. This is used to calculate people's budgets. So a lot of times people don't provide that information or, um, you know, oh, I don't know the exact amount, I'll tell you later, and then they forget. Um, but it can affect the amount of the grant that someone receives. So, you know, providing these things are important to people's benefits. Yeah. Um, I know it says car title there. I think uh, I would actually amend this slide. Sorry, I, and I'm responsible for that, so it's my fault. Um, I would say it's actually the registration that they tend mm -hmm. to require more um, because that has the, the information um, that they need. So don't worry if someone doesn't have the title or can't find the title. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and this information is usually needed also for CalFresh. So if folks are getting CalWORKs, they're often also applying for CalFresh. And like Juliana said, those housing and shelter costs, those can be used as like deductions for CalFresh. So it is really important for folks to have those if they have those costs. And shelter costs just can include like utility costs as well. Um, and so like there is a standard deduction for utilities, but some people exceed that standard deduction. So, you know, if people have utility costs, they can also provide um, those to the county as well. And medical costs, if there's someone who's disabled or elderly in the home can also result in deductions, so. Okay. Um, Okay, so there's also a state law um, that allows the, so the state law that allows people with U visas or trafficking survivors who aren't yet federally eligible um, to get CalWORKs and other state benefits. Um, that law also has special rules about what documentation they're needing. So for example, if we look at the prior list, if someone's a U visa applicant, they're undocumented, they're a victim of crime, and let's say they're fleeing the abuser and they've just filed a U visa, they don't have an SSN yet, they may not have a valid ID, um, they may not have their children's birth certificates, if, especially if say like their children were born abroad or if the abuser stole their documents, which is super common, like I left, I was able to bring some of my documents with, but like some of them are in the house and I can't get them. Um, so just know that for um, DV or trafficking survivors who don't have all the documentation, um, there are workarounds that the county is specifically instructed to use. Um, the most common one is someone with a U visa won't have an SSN until after they get their work permit. And so, um, and then same with a trafficking survivor. Um, who doesn't yet have a TV, so they won't have a work permit, they won't have a, an SSN. And so the county can generate what's called a pseudo SSN that's just used for computer purposes. Um, they can also use non-standard identity documents like a foreign ID or a non-photo ID, or they can even just sign something under penalty of perjury saying I am who I am. Um, for trafficking victims to prove that they're a trafficking victim, because for the U visa, they have to have filed the application. So they have to provide proof they've filed the application. 
um, for trafficking victims, they can be eligible while they're working on the application um, and their own sworn statement that they're working on the application is enough. Um, after 12 months, they have to have proof that the application has been filed. Um, just some issues for mixed status families. Um, these questions get asked a lot. Um, let's say someone is undocumented, they're not applying for the U visa, they're not a trafficking survivor, they don't meet the Prucol definition and they're not otherwise eligible. They can still apply for benefits on behalf of an eligible family member, like on behalf of an eligible child. Um, applications can distinguish between applicants and non-applicants. So you're gonna have to list all the people in the household that are family members living together, but you can say like, I mom am not applying for myself. I'm just applying for my US citizen children. And then those non-applicants are not required to provide their immigration status. They cannot ask me if I'm undocumented and I do not have to tell them and I should not tell them. Um, non-applicants without an SSN can also not be required to provide one. So if I have an SSN, I have to give it to them, um, but I don't have to give it to them if I don't have one. Um, I think Juliana mentioned this, but just because it has happened many times over the years in my experience, if someone has an SSN that maybe was not issued by the Social Security Administration or not issued to them by the Social Security Administration, they should not give that to the Social Services Department. You would think that would go without saying, but it does not. Um, so if you got an SSN at La Tropicana, keep it to yourself. Do not give that to social um, services or anyone else. Um, and never provide false or misleading information. So all they have to say is, I don't have an SSN. All they have to say is, I'm not an eligible immigrant or I'm not applying for myself. There are lots of lawfully present immigrants who are not eligible. So like someone on an H-1B visa or someone on a student visa or um, you know, a tourist visa. There are all sorts of reasons somebody could be not applying for themselves or might not have an SSN um, other than being undocumented. Um, and the information provided on the application is used only to determine eligibility for benefits. By law, they are not allowed to pass that on to like USCIS or anything like that. Um, so I know, especially during the last administration, a lot of people were scared of this. Just important for, um, for everybody to know. Um, okay. Public charge. Um, so fear that getting benefits will hurt immigration status. People may or may not know the exact term public charge, but I think almost every non-citizen I have worked with has had some idea. They may not know the specifics, but they're like, I I'm pretty sure getting public benefits will hurt my immigration status. Um, people hear stories on the radio, on the news. Um, oh my gosh, people are like, I had someone who was like, well, I talked to someone at my church who told me this, and it turned out it was like, the neighbor who lived next door who sat on her stoop who was not an attorney who just gave out unsolicited information about immigration law. Um, so there's a lot of rumors going around about public charge. But here's what you need to know. Almost no immigrants impacted by the public charge rule are eligible for CalWORKs. So public charge applies only to some immigrants when they are seeking a green card or seeking a visa to enter the country. So people who have a green card are not subject to public charge unless they leave the country for so long that they have to go through a technical process of readmission, um, which is different than like just, I went to Mexico for a month and I came back. Um, if you have left so long that like your green card is basically suspended, 
and you need to reapply, then public charge can be an issue. But otherwise, anybody who has a green card doesn't need to worry about it. People who are applying for citizenship don't need to worry about it. Humanitarian immigrants do not need to worry about it. So there is no public charge test for U visa, T visa, SIGIS, asylees, refugees, temporary protected status, um, special immigrant visas. None of these people have a public charge test. Um, it also does not count benefits received by people other than the immigrants, such as benefits received by children or other family members. Um, so, um, let's see. Oh, uh, just the other thing I was going to say. So when it does apply, it's like someone who is applying for a family-based visa for the first time, they're going to look at a totality of circumstances to determine whether this person is going to be able to support themselves in the US in the future. And one of the factors they can look at is whether that immigrant applying for the family-based visa has received public benefits in the past, and specifically just cash aid, not food stamps, not WIC, not anything else. Um, but if someone is applying for a family-based visa, they have probably not been eligible to get CalWORKs for themselves in the past. Um, so I've been asked about public charge by dozens and dozens and dozens of advocates and immigrants over the years. And I can think of two times when someone had received benefits and was subject to the public charge test. So it's like, needle in a haystack. Um, but it is one of the big reasons that people who are in mixed status families or who are immigrants themselves do not apply for CalWORKs even if they're eligible. Um, okay, legal rights. All right, uh, so legal rights, public benefits recipients have the right to be treated without discrimination. They have the right to language access. Um, so if they are not English speaking or if they prefer to um, communicate in a language other than English, the county is going to be required to provide them language access services. Um, disability accommodation. So if someone has a disability, they can notify their eligibility worker and their eligibility worker and the county is going to be required to provide them with accommodations for that disability. Uh, they are, they have the right to confidentiality. So not disclosing anything about your benefits to other people um, or anything about you to other people. Uh, they have the right to adequate notice. So if there's going to be changes to your benefits. Uh, the county is required to provide adequate notice of those changes. And people have the right to file an administrative appeal. Um, so if someone gets terminated from benefits, their benefits get reduced, they receive an overpayment, um, or even if they think they should be getting more benefits uh, than they are actually receiving, they can appeal those decisions um, the notices that come should have deadlines on them for when you need to file the appeal by. Um, but if you miss that date, you can uh, um, sometimes have reasons to request good cause for filing a late appeal. Uh, people also have the right to have legal representation at their administrative appeals, for their administrative appeals and for hearings. Um, and so, you know, we are one of a few organizations that does provide legal representation for people in administrative appeals. So appeals, people have the right to request a hearing. Uh, that hearing will be conducted before an administrative law judge to dispute any county action. Um, you need to request those hearings within 90 days of the date of notice of action. So um, if a notice was sent and it was adequate, 
you have to request your hearing within 90 days. Um, you have an additional 180 days if good cause for not requesting the hearing at an earlier date. Um, you can request a hearing in writing or you can call. Um, you can also fax a request to the county. And the fax number is listed there. Um, and the phone number is listed on the slide as well. You can also mail in your request if you don't have access to a phone um, or fax. You can also drop off your appeals request in person at the office. Um, yeah. So there's a question in the chat about other organizations that help with um, CalWORKs and appeals. Um, so there, the Law Foundation, sometimes the health legal services can help people um, if they meet certain criteria and Asian Law Alliance has um, one attorney who can help people as well. So people have the right to have counsel in the appeals, but not to have it provided for them. So like if they want to have an attorney and one is available, they have the right to have that person there, but there's it's not like a public defender system where you're guaranteed everybody who wants to file an appeal is like issued an attorney. Um, so there are about three people. Um, there's about 5,000 people on CalWORKs. Um, so we do try and do as many as possible. And honestly, I will say with CalWORKs, we rarely reach capacity. So um, if something requires a hearing, we are usually able to um, we are usually able to at least give the person like advice and help them um, understand their rights and how to make their arguments. And very often we are able to represent them in the hearing. Um, it's not a really complicated process. So filing an appeal sounds really intimidating. It sounds like something you need a lawyer to do. Literally on the back of the notice, there's a fill in the blank thing that says, do you want to appeal? And you can say yes. And then why do you want to appeal? And I tell people, all you have to write is, I disagree with the county. And to be honest, even as the attorney, when I request appeals for a client, that is what I write. <laughs> because there's no reason to be any more specific than that. Yes, because the notice might say you're being like terminated for reason X, and it turns out you're actually being terminated for reason Y. Um, so yeah, so just I disagree with the county and faxing that in or um, calling in to file that appeal, um, that 800 number. Um, we also have, it's not on here, but in Santa Clara County, there is also an ombudsman who can also troubleshoot issues outside the appeals process. Um, clients can call her or email her directly. Um, that is often the person like Juliana or I will contact to first. kind of resolve low level issues first. Let's say someone got denied because the worker misunderstood their immigration status. And we're like, they shouldn't need to go to a hearing on this. Like someone just needs to explain this. Um, or if a client doesn't understand what's going on with their benefits at all, and they don't have any of the notices, um, the ombudsman can be extremely helpful in just kind of like helping you piece together what's going on so you can help your client understand that. And then if an appeal is necessary, at least you have all of the facts. Yeah. Um. The guidelines that we presented today, do they apply for all counties in California? So almost all of them, the only ones that were county specific were uh, the HSP program. It has certain required elements that any county that runs an HSP program is required to have, and some elements are optional. So for example, not every county um, pays for rental insurance as part of their HSP. Um, but Santa Clara County does choose to. Not every county has employment incentives, but Santa Clara County chooses to. Um, so when counties operate an HSP program, they tell the state what elements they want to include. Um, 
to use the money for. They have like kind of this like array of options they can use the money for and the county decides. Um, but other than that HSP program, everything else that we've talked about, the rules should be same across counties, um, other than the fax number for the appeals unit, of course. Okay. Um, Lisa, we had another question um, about whether or not we had a flyer um, or another sort of handout with the different supportive services that CalWORKs offers. That is a great question. Um, I do not know the answer off the top of my head. <laughs> we have a lot of materials in our CalWORKs um, files, and I don't know if we do have one. It is probably quite dated and we would need to review it. Um, <laughs> maybe that is something we can commit to getting back to you on. Um, I think we provided some handouts in advance. I don't know if those were already sent to the participants. Um, okay. Um, I was going to say we could, we could also pass on that flyer if we find it. Or we can send an updated one once we do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the supportive services are just so underutilized and especially the childcare. I can just tell you as a parent of a young child, childcare is so expensive and it is so much more than the amount of the grant. People think, oh, I don't wanna get CalWORKs. Like at the end of the day, I only get like a couple hundred dollars or something because I'm working and then they take my child support. So I only end up a couple hundred dollars ahead. But if you have two children under like kinder, you could be getting like $4,000 worth of free childcare. And the state's subsidized childcare program is kind of like section eight. You have a universe of families who are eligible for it, but there's very few on ramps and people can be waiting on the wait list for childcare for years. So, um, CalWORKs is one of the only guaranteed on ramps to the subsidized child care. Um, and that child care, it's not necessarily like, it's not like, oh, you have to go to this government center. Um, it can be, they can reimburse for child care by a, like a relative or by like a small family provider. So it can be someone that you already have selected and are comfortable with as the child care provider, as long as they agree to accept um, the rate, which they've increased lately and is, is actually pretty, pretty competitive. Um, they can also provide referrals to child care, of course, if you don't have them. Um, okay. Any other questions before we go into our last Gloria scenario? Okay. All right. Gloria got switched to a new worker and she just got a notice that her works will end because she doesn't have a green card. The notice also says she has an overpayment because her benefits should have been calculated for a family of only two. Yesterday, she heard someone on the radio say that she could be denied a visa if she gets, a, if she gets welfare. Gloria is in a panic. She doesn't want to risk her immigration status. True story. Yeah has actually happened. Okay. Most important question, is Gloria in trouble with immigration? Okay. 
Thank you, thank you to the 50% of you who are still with us, still participating in the polls. Um, and I'm sorry to do this to you because this is another trick question. Um, she got an overpayment, but it is not fraud, okay? Not every overpayment is fraud. In fact, if she gave her immigration status to the worker and the worker incorrectly decided her eligibility, that is an administrative error. It's not fraud. It's not even Gloria's fault. So when we have overpayments, they're usually categorized as either administrative error, inadvertent household error, which is like just accidental, or intentional program violation, which is their word for fraud. 95% um, of overpayments are either administrative error or inadvertent household error. It's usually that thing where like, oh, I just didn't realize I went over the income reporting threshold. I forgot to report at month four, but I reported it on my semi-annual report. So like I have an overpayment for the two months. Um, so there's no fraud. Um, we'll see if she has to go off aid. Um, but first of all, public charge does not apply to her. So if she's worried about getting in trouble with immigration because of what she heard on the radio, that getting welfare will hurt your immigration status, she, remember um, Steve, her abuser, um, she is going to get a U visa. A U visa has been filed. Really glad that 80% of you know U visa, no public charge. Um, okay. Okay. And then the next question what should she do? Okay. Okay, most of you are right. She should file an appeal right away. Why would she file an appeal? Because the worker is wrong. Worker said she's not eligible because she doesn't have a green card. But if you remember that list of people who can get CalWORKs, there's a lot of people on it besides green card holders. Now, in the eligibility workers defense, most of the non-citizens that the eligibility workers are used to seeing get CalWORKs are green card holders because that's like the most common status um, of people who are eligible. Um, there aren't as many people with the U visa. There aren't as many people with humanitarian parole. So people who have those humanitarian statuses are more likely to get incorrectly denied or incorrectly terminated. Unfortunately, I've seen it happen a number of times where the person who did the initial eligibility knew the rules and knew the exception and put the person on. And then the case gets transferred to someone else who doesn't know the rules and is just like, what? This person doesn't have a green card. And they both kick them off the program and say they were overpaid for getting it in the first place. Um, so just really wanna you know, emphasize just because something happens to someone's CalWORKs doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Um, and a lot of, I mean, if it was, then literally our job wouldn't exist. Um, uh, so a lot of what we do is help clarify misunderstandings. Like a lot of the issues have to do with exceptions to general rules. 
um, that are less common. And so the eligibility workers aren't as familiar with them. And it's our job to be familiar with all the exceptions and all the little nitty gritty rules um, and to like advocate. So yeah, absolutely. The first thing they should do is file an appeal um, and that'll keep her aid going while she waits for the appeal if she does it right away. Um, yeah, she shouldn't have to take out a loan to repay the money. Unfortunately, that is what my client did before they came to us. Um, uh, if they did genuinely owe the money and they did genuinely, like if they were genuinely not eligible, then they might want to go off aid and ask for a repayment plan. Um, but yeah, should not need to take out a loan. Um, Okay, thank you so much for everybody who's putting comments in the chat. Um, I know technically we are um, here until 1230, I believe. Is that right, Nicole? Um, we do have one more um, sample scenario that we just like threw in as a bonus. We weren't sure if we would get to it. And then we're also happy to stay on here and answer questions um, people may have. So um, I really appreciate everybody who's taken the time to be with us today, though, and I understand for those of you who have conflicting 12 o'clocks, um, the materials will be sent or were sent out already. Um, so reach out if you didn't get those. OK, so bonus scenario. Um, like I said, all of these scenarios are compilations of different things we've seen with clients. Um, this is another chance to meet Pete. All right. So Pete is 55 years old. He used to work as a mechanic until he hurt his back in a motorcycle accident four years ago and had to quit. He, now he lives in an RV, takes too many pain pills, and is just scraping by. Pete's 15-year-old son just got in a fight with his mom. Pete's ex, and he wants to move in with Pete. Pete wants to step up. So we have a couple questions. What help could CalWORKs give this family and what barriers might they face? And we don't have polling questions for this one. This is kind of a more open-ended. We figured if we got to it at the end, um, so I would love to see in the chat if anybody has ideas on if Pete comes to you. Um, I would say very rarely do folks come to us and say, hey, I've been thinking about this CalWORKs program. Should I get this? Um, it's, it's really up to folks who are like kind of at the front lines helping people who are, you know, Pete might be coming to us because you know, he wants to get into housing or because his RV has been towed and now he's like on the, you know, on the wait list. Um, he or may he have might been want on help getting the, custody with his yeah, son. He, he might have been on the like homeless assistance wait list for quite some time. And he's about to get into a place for a single person. And now he's like, can I get my son in there? Um, so flagging CalWORKs anytime there's a minor child in the household. Uh, yeah, great idea. Hotel to start with. So that temporary homeless assistance. Um, does Pete count as homeless? Yes. Living in an RV, he's going to count as homeless. So if that RV is not a good place for his 15-year-old son, which I'm going to guess it's not, getting into that hotel, he can get 16 nights. Um, and that gives you a little time to start looking at what other options. Um, let's see, 15 year old probably doesn't need childcare. Yeah, cash aid. So the CalWORKs cash assistance um, might also need food stamps. Um, they can get both of them. Um, what about supportive services? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Someone mentioned drug counseling. Um, and that can actually be 
Pete's, so he doesn't have a job right now. He might run into issues. They say, oh, you've got to work. And a lot of times the client just says, okay, the rule is I have to work. And then they can't actually do it. So they end up getting booted off. So flagging right away that he may need an exemption due to his disability, due to his back, but also that he might um, need drug counseling or something like that as a supportive service. Um, yeah, he can be on CalWORKs while he applies for disability benefits if that's if his disability is serious enough that he's going to apply for, or going to qualify for Social Security. So he can't receive both Social Security and CalWORKs at the same time, but there's no rule against him applying for SSI while he's on CalWORKs. Cache does not have to be paid back. No. Um, and Janet, he yeah. does not have to have legal custody of his son as long as his son is living with him because he is a caretaker relative or in this case, the, the parent. Yep. He may need though, like if he and, um, if he and uh, the, I don't think we said the kid's name, if he and the kid's mom weren't to like, weren't married at the time, um, like if there's any question about parentage, because it is for children and a caretaker relative, he may need to prove that he's a relative of the child. So like if he's on the birth certificate, he may want to get a copy of that. Um, generally, that's not an issue though. Um, let's see, anything else? Lisa, uh, if uh, CalWORKs wanted a um, paternity test, would they have to pay for that? So, there's a question of whether they can require it. Um, that is really interesting one. But if they can, I think it is certainly something that CalWORKs. So CalWORKs has a duty to assist people if they cannot obtain the verifications themselves. So if Pete has a paternity test lying around, yes, Pete can be required to turn it over. If CalWORKs is asking Pete to jump through an additional hoop of cooperating with a paternity test, um, then yes, he should do that, but they should pay for it. Um, but also I will say in California, legal parentage can be different than biological parentage. So even if Pete is not the biological father, but let's say he was together with the kid's mom and he was acting as the father for years and years, he can still be the legal father. Um, but Pete may need in that case to, to file a paternity action. Um, what support financial resources are available to clients who are struggling to pay back overpayments that are due to county employee error? So if people are still on CalWORKs, there are rules about the, what's called the recoupment rate. So they can pay off the overpayment using a percentage of their benefits. There are also situations in which um, you can get the, the overpayment waived you can get the overpayment waived, exactly. So especially if it's a county error, um, that is definitely something that uh, we handle hearings for. Um, there's something called equitable estoppel, um, which is like a very lawyerly sounding term for basically not fair. <laughs> um, if the county had all the information needed to make the right decision and they did not, and the client relied on the county saying you are eligible um, and you can prove certain other types of hardship to the client in repaying, then the county should not be able to collect that CalWORKs overpayment. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something to refer people for. If they're not on CalWORKs anymore, um, they can do things like take their um, tax return called a tax offset. Um, and the people can come to us after they've been off CalWORKs as well to help with issues regarding overpayments. Depending on what it is and the statute of limitations, if they never challenged the original overpayment, there may or may not be things we can do to help, but we can at least look into it. Um, okay. Okay, I think that that's a, a lot of good stuff about Pete. 
Um, just a question for my benefit. I'm guessing I know what EHV is, but uh, would whoever put that in the chat, would you be able to tell us what EHV is? I have a feeling it's it's a housing thing and not a CalWORKs thing. Um, emergency housing voucher. Awesome. Yep, that's what I was going to guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so really great to like kind of connect those things together. I think one of the challenges as they have put a lot of resources into these housing and homelessness supports for CalWORKs families is a lot of times it's challenging to integrate the systems. The people who know about the housing vouchers are not always the people who know about the CalWORKs homeless assistance and vice versa. So the eligibility worker who's approving the homelessness assistance may not know to tell them to apply for an emergency housing voucher and vice versa, the person who's processing that housing voucher, and it takes a while, may not know that there's some temporary assistance available through CalWORKs. Um, so I'm so glad that a lot of you who kind of like have some, um, have a foot in both of those worlds are kind of getting cross-trained on this. Because um, I think you're in a really good position to kind of flag those things for clients and help connect the dots um, of those resources. Okay. Um, I think the last the last slide is just our contact information. Um, so if you have clients who um, I can answer I can answer all these these questions. Um, but for folks who have to jump off, just if you have clients that need our help, um, the referral is through our legal advice line. Um, the number is there. It's staffed 930 to about noon, Monday through Thursday, um, depending on how many calls they get. Um, and everybody who calls during that window um, will either get through to someone or will have the option of receiving a call back. Um, but they need to leave their phone number to get a call back. And they also need to, I advise people to, to say whether it's okay to leave a voicemail, just because we do get a lot of people um, who are victims of domestic violence. We don't like to leave voicemails identifying who we are um, just for privacy reasons. So um, if people leave a voicemail, just, make sure that they're saying it's okay to call me back it's okay to leave a voicemail and if it's yep. not okay to leave a voicemail also say that um and then for more questions or technical assistance like uh is this the sort of thing i should refer to you guys or like someone you know a client came to me and told me this is happening with their case does you know does that sound like the sort of thing we should refer to you or does that sound right um those sort of technical assistance questions, feel free to reach out to Juliana or myself directly. Um, yes, and thank you for everyone who attended to please fill out the survey monkey form that Nicole put in the chat. Um, question, does CalWORKs have a rapid rehousing? Is that what RRH? Rapid rehousing program um, or something similar to it? So, the, the closest thing they have is that homeless assistance and the HSP. So those kind of follow, a the HSP programs are supposed to follow a sort of rapid rehousing homeless assistant or um, housing first model. Um, and there is more about the, Calif uh, well, there's more on the California Department of Social Services webpage, but also on the, um, Department of Employment and Benefit Services, the County Deb's office website about the HSP program. Um, yeah, and Abode is um, the provider of a lot of the services through HSP, so um, they're also um, a good place to connect clients to. Okay, great. Um, like I said, uh, we have like eight minutes left. So everybody is welcome to jump off if you need to, but if anyone has a specific question, um, feel free to stay on and ask. And you can just unmute and ask your question if you want. Um, we do sometimes give trainings for community members 
Um, we primarily do trainings for like folks who are direct service providers. Um, but for example, I think we've been asked to provide a training um, uh, later this month to like we've given trainings through like parent programs of the schools. Um, I think uh, we're doing a parent program later this month. Um, yeah, feel free also to reach out to Juliana or I if you have a question about arranging a subsequent training. Um, okay. And we also appreciate on that survey, Monkey, if you have, I don't know if there's a question, but if you have any suggestions for improvement, feel free to put them on there. And I'm sure um, Nicole will pass them our way or to reach out to us at our email addresses. Um, don't be shy because we're, we're learning how to adapt this training to Zoom. Um, so feedback is welcome. Okay. Is it possible to put the contact information back on just real quick? I need to get the email. Sure. Sorry about that. No, that's OK. There you go. I wasn't fast enough. <laughs> and you did mention we will be getting these slides as well, correct? Yes, we have these slides. Um, let's see, what other materials did we include? A couple include? handouts. Uh, we have, a, I think, a more detailed chart of non-citizen eligibility. Um, trying to think of what else we may have given. Um, and we will follow up looking to see if we have a flyer on um, supportive services. I'm on a mission to let everybody know about childcare. I love it. Thank you. I do have a question. You yeah. had mentioned that rapid rehousing is overseen by uh, a boat. Is that correct? So no, it's not. It's not called rapid rehousing for CalWORKs. Um, so the CalWORKs family family supportive. Sorry, it's the FSP and the HSP, like Family Support Program, Housing Support Program, something along those lines. The Housing Support Program is part of the FSP. So people can get the FSP services even if they don't need housing support. If they need other case management services, they can get the Family Support Program. But the Housing Support Program, um, some of those services listed are done by abode. Um, and I actually don't know the specifics of which ones a boat does. Um, like I know they don't provide legal services, for example. Um, okay. Thank you. But um, a boat yeah, would do the, a boat would do the the housing search and all that stuff, case management. But I don't think you can just call a boat up and and get help. I think you there's got to be a referral process, probably through the probably through the CalWORKs worker that's handling the case. They may need to be referred by CalWORKs, but the clients can self-refer to CalWORKs. So right. they don't have to go through any like portal to get referred for those. They can just tell their eligibility worker or their welfare to work worker that they want to get HSP programs. They can do that when they apply for CalWORKs. They can do it at any point after they're on CalWORKs as right. well. Right. I, yeah. I just, I, I'm just trying to say that uh, one cannot just call a BODE and expect that they're going to help with housing. Because many clients yeah. will think that, and even some case managers will think that. Uh, and it's important to make sure they go through the proper protocol. They're just going to hit a, a wall. No, I appreciate that clarification. I, that's absolutely right. And also that a BODE operates many different programs. And so if the client doesn't mention CalWORKs, Abode's not going to automatically know that they want the HSP program anyways. Hopefully, if the client said, I'm trying to get CalWORKs HSP, Abode would tell them to go to the county. Um, but yeah, a lot of times, a lot of what Juliana and I do, it's really, it's um, kind of translating in a lot of ways. Um, for clients and recipients, 
um, who just don't know the right words to use to explain what their problem is or what they need or what exception they might qualify for. Um, so a lot of these cases, people are not getting what they should be. People are getting terminated for reasons they shouldn't be. And it's just because someone needs to like, kind of like dig into it underneath the surface and get the right information or the magic words to the right person. Um, so I know sometimes people are a little shy about asking or, or referring to legal aid. Um, like, is the county going to be mad that like we're, you know, sicking lawyers on them? Like, really, we meet regularly with the CalWORKs team. We're in like, you know, regular contact with the ombudsman. They understand the role that we play. We kind of help troubleshoot and help a lot of the people who fall in the cracks for the program. Um, so the county is never gonna be mad that someone got help from legal aid or that someone filed an appeal about their CalWORKs. Um, and there's no cost to file an appeal. There's no like risk with it. You can file an appeal. And if you decide that it, like, it turns out that you're not eligible, you can just drop your appeal. Um, it's not like a big court case. And also sometimes like with overpayments or things like that, the county finds errors later in their own calculations when you do the appeal. And so, you know, even short of actually doing that hearing, sometimes you can get your overpayment reduced or um, yeah. something like that. So, yeah, J just to give an example, like Juliana just handled an overpayment case or is in the process of handling it, where even just getting the county's appeals worker, which is kind of like a more experienced eligibility worker to look at the case, they've already gotten the $7,000 overpayment reduced to like $2,000 just yeah. by having someone else double check the county's math. So it can really be worth it for clients to file an appeal anytime there's an overpayment or a termination or something like that. I always tell people it doesn't hurt. Um, my motto is it, it doesn't hurt to ask the worst people are going to say is no. So Okay, any other questions? Okay, with that, I think we're at 1230. Thank you so much, um, Nicole, for arranging this training again and for, um, for giving us really the time to like get stuck into the materials and make it interactive um, yeah, and stuff. We you. really appreciate it. Thank you both so much. Uh, I'm seeing feedback already trickle in. I'm gonna send that link out um, to get some more, but so far we've heard people loved the scenario stuff. So that was great. Poor great. Gloria. I know. <laughs> well, thank you all. Have to... Oh, go ahead. Oh, so, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say thank you all once again, and we will be having a few more trainings this month and shortly we'll be putting out an announcement for the next part of our Navigating Mainstream Benefits series, which will be on Medi-Cal, Medicare, and Covered State. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.